Okay, so let's start this. So um, welcome everyone. Today our speaker is Jacob Steinwhite, and Jacob is a very accomplished researcher. So. Sorry for that confusion. Uh, so Jacob did his undergrad and master's at Clark University in Massachusetts and worked in the lab of John Gibbons and Robert Revel. Then he joined Antonis Rocker's lab at Vanderbilt University for his PhD, where he's currently pursuing his PhD research. And he has been involved in many successful collaborations, including uh, papers of about 30 papers, where 11 of them he has been as a first author. Now, beyond scientific contribution, he has promoted diversity, equality, inclusion in science, and he was the president of inclusivity in the Biosciences Association at Vanderbilt University, and currently serves as inclusion coordinator at the Evolutionary Studies Initiative. In his free time, he can be found rock climbing and making art, and his award-winning art has featured in multiple places. And it's uh, now he has a shop, Sai Art Shop, which is pretty incredible. Uh, it has uh, mugs, stickers, and hoodies. So hopefully, Jacob will provide the link uh, after the talk if you anybody wants to go and buy something. And then all the profits that comes from that shop goes to wildlife conservation efforts. And since August 2020, when he started the shop, he has raised nearly $1,000 and looking forward to create more art for Earth. With that introduction, uh, I'll hand it over to Jacob and let's enjoy a good talk. Yeah, thank you so much for that introduction, very kind introduction. And thanks for this opportunity to share some of the recent research findings um, that I've had. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, you're good. Cool, thank you. Okay, so I, I know a lot of people, they probably um, are not aware of who I am, so I just wanted to take a moment to introduce myself first. And I think it's hard to introduce myself without introducing those who helped shape me into the person that I am today. And so that's my family. This is, you know, before COVID and it was my sister Emily's wedding. She's now married to Josh. There's my other sister, Nina, and her husband, Gary, and my parents, Howard and Mercy. And so one great thing about this family is not only their support for the various endeavors that I have, but it's a ever growing family. So please help me welcome the newest member of the family. Um, my goddaughter, my niece, Liberty, Emily and Josh's daughter. And so I also am bringing this up to say that if you hear a baby crying, um, please note that I'm living in the same household as the newborn. So one thing that um, Vikas had mentioned is this like Art for Earth project that I've done against something that's had a lot of support from my family and it's trying to give people a way to pur purchase with purpose. So as mentioned before, 100% of profits go toward global conservation efforts. And um, it's not just about creating these like Andy style Warhol and Andy Warhol style portraits of organisms, but it's about trying to highlight endangered species to raise awareness about their endangered status and in a very fantastic sort of way, immortalize these endangered species. And so since opening in August, the Sci Art Shop has raised a little shy of $1,000 for wildlife conservation. And I'm really looking forward to trying to help promote this planetary initiative to help preserve wildlife. But yes, today I'm here to talk a bit about the science. As Vikas had mentioned, it. Um, everything that I've done so far has primarily occurred in the Antonis Rokas lab with the exception of my undergrad and master's work. And this has all been done at Vanderbilt University um, with Antonis and he's a wonderful, wonderful mentor. 
Some of the things that Antonis studies includes trying to understand evolutionary relationships between organisms, as well as decipher what parameters influence our inferences. He also studies the evolution of human pregnancy and um, the evolution of yeasts and molds. And this is where a lot of the work that I've done has fallen into the umbrella of the larger research initiative run by Antonis. More specifically, I've really been interested in the rapid tempo of evolution amongst fungi. And so to this end, I've done some analysis looking at ancient rapid evolutionary events, more recent rapid evolutionary events, as well as developed some methods and software. One example of an ancient rapid evolutionary event that I've studied is hypermutation in a lineage of budding yeast, specifically yeast from the genus Hensinia spora, for which there are two lineages, one that has underg undergone punctuated sequence evolution and one that has uh, a historical much slower uh, relative mutation rate. And these mutation rates are associated with loss of different types of genes, namely DNA repair genes and cell cycle genes that likely led to this uh, historical genetic instability. When it comes to software, I've developed a couple different softwares. Some of them do very simple things such as Ortho Fisher, which helps uh, create automated extractions of genes across genomes using profile HMMs and GG Pub Figs, which helps create publication quality figures in R, but importantly using colorblind friendly color palettes so that your R, your art, sorry, <laughs> your figures are accessible to as many people as possible. Some of the other software that I've developed is a little bit more complex, such as ClipKit and its follow-up software, PhiKit, a toolkit for phylogenetic analyses. And I want to just mention briefly one of these software, specifically ClipKit. So ClipKit is an alignment trimming toolkit, so it's part of that pipeline for phylogenetic analysis where you align homologous sequences, trim that resulting alignment, and then infer the evolutionary history of those sequences. And what's different about ClipKit in comparison to some of the other software is that other software identifies highly divergent sites, which are thought to be erroneously inferred due to multiple substitutions um, or erroneous inference of homology, but instead focuses on keeping phylogenetically informative sites. And so there's different modes in which it does this, but just to summarize how it performed, in comparison to other alignment trimming software, um, this figure captures that. And this is specifically across simulated data sets. So no trimming performed the best because each one of these sites is perfectly aligned and evolving under simulated conditions. But then when you compare it to the other trimmers, we have ClipKit, which has that blue star above it, um, outperforming all of the others. And the variables that we examined included tree topology accuracy, tree support, as well as accuracy of branch length, branch length estimation. But today I'll be spending the majority of the time talking about a very recent rapid evolutionary event, and that is hybridization amongst fungal pathogens. And this was published in Current Biology in 2020. Um, I also wanna take the time to thank Abigail Lind, who was the co-first author on the project. So hybridization amongst fungal pathogens, before we get into that, I just wanna talk briefly about a very iconic and well-known hybrid, and that's the mule. The mule is so iconic because it's been used to bridge physically distant cultures and acquire physically distant resource resources. And part of the reason it's been able to do that is because of a phenomenon called hybrid vigor. So from the donkey, it has some of its best traits like strength, patience, and endurance. And from the, the horse, some of the best traits as well, like athletic ability, and speed and it's the having the best parts of each parent is what gives it this hybrid figure. And now the only reason genetically speaking that a mule is even possible is because despite some pretty big phenotypic differences between the donkey and the horse, genetically speaking, they're very, very similar to one another. And so this is what what allows the, the mule to be even possible. Although I would I will mention that the mule is an evolutionary dead end because it's sterile. Now there's different types of hybridization that's known to occur amongst um, microbes, hybrid speciation, hybridization, as well as introgressive hybridization. And they've been studied extensively um, 
I want to shout out Eva Stuckenbrock, who's done amazing work on filamentous plant pathogens, as well as Tony Gabaldon, who's done amazing work on fungal pathogens of yeast. And they've both unraveled how these different types of hybridization have contributed to the evolutionary history of these fungi. Today, we'll be talking about hybrid speciation, wherein two distinct species of fungi kind of came together and formed a new hybrid fungus. And so that's where the bulk of the talk starts. Um, when two become one, the hybrid origin of a filamentous fungal pathogen. So I'll talk a little bit about Aspergillus fungi, give them a brief introduction, and then talk about the genomics of these hybrids, as well as the phenotyping that we did of the hybrids. Aspergillus is home to a lot of deadly fungal pathogens or species that belong to the genus Aspergillus. And these pathogens pose a clinical, economic, and social threat to humans, and they're responsible for 200,000 plus infections a year. However, if you look across the tree of Aspergillus species, you'll notice that not all of them are pathogens, as denoted by the maroon pink circle. And so one of the questions that the Rokas lab and many others are interested in understanding is what are the evolutionary forces that lead to some organisms being pathogenic, whereas others are harmless or some other fungi are actually beneficial to human well-being. And so to address this question, we decided to take a very focused investigation on one particular species, Aspergillus nigillans. Aspergillus nigillans primarily infects those with chronic granulomatous disease, commonly just referred to as CGD, but it's recently been associated with other lung-related diseases. More specifically, what we did is we acquired Aspergillus nigillans from the hospital. Um, we grew them up in plates, we conducted genome sequencing, and uh, we did other analyses, including the phenotyping. Now, they were identified as Aspergillus nigillans in the clinic by clinicians, but when we had sequenced their genomes and gotten a hold of that information, we realized that they were very different than um, the typical Aspergillus species. A typical Aspergillus genome has around 10,000 genes, a genome size of 30 megabases, and the number of duplicated BUSCO genes is often very, very low, typically very, very low. But these clinical isolates shown in purple, they had twice of everything. So they had twice the number of genes, twice the genome size, and along the z-axis, they had many of these duplicated BUSCO genes or these otherwise near universally single copy orthologous genes. And so this led us to believe, well, perhaps these are hybrids because we're, we're seeing duplicates of everything and, you know, there's two copies of, of um, what, what we expect to be there. So we conducted uh, molecular phylogenet phylogenetic analyses to sort of disentangle their evolutionary history. And what we noticed is that uh, the, each isolate had two copies of taxonomically informative loci. So for example, calmodulin. And just to highlight this further, there's one strain, ASFU2033, that fell into two different clades. Um, two sequences for the same locus that fell into two distinct clades. And so using this analysis, we are able to determine that one parent shown in blue is a species called Aspergillus spinulosporus, whereas the other parent shown in red is a close relative of Aspergillus quadrilineatus, but we don't know exactly what the other parent is. That parent could be alive or may have gone extinct, we're not sure. But nonetheless, this uh, molecular phylogenetic analysis allowed us to determine that the two parental species, again, were spinulosporus, a close relative of quadrilineatus, and additional genome sequencing of type strains allowed us to narrow it down to the new species being Aspergillus latus. Now, the way that we think this happened is through cellular fusion or plasma gamete between the two species that were physically proximal to one another. And then that heterocarion, underwent nuclear fusion or karyogamy to then form Aspergillus latus, this diploid um, allopolyploid. And so one other thing to note is that both asexual spores and sexual spores of Aspergillus latus are viable. So it's not an evolutionary dead end like it is for the mule. 
Now that we had the genome sequences of all of these hybrid genomes, we next wanted to do genomic analyses on the stability of these genomes to try and understand how old the hybrid is or if, it's, if this is a genetically stable um, uh, situation for these hybrids. To do so, we had to first assign each gene to a parent of origin. And the way that we did that was to calculate sequence divergence of each gene to a known parent. So we knew what one of those parents were, and we just calculated sequence divergence between every single gene in the hybrid to that known parent. And we plotted it in a histogram. So we have on the y-axis gene count and then sequence divergence on the x-axis. And what you'll find is that some genes have very low to no sequence divergence to that one parent. And so those are all the genes that came from that one parent. But then there'll be a second set of genes, this bimodal distribution. And that second mode, that second Gaussian distribution represents genes that come from the other parent. And so you can look at a pie chart of them and sort of get a sense of how much each parent is contributing to the given genome. And just to, to hammer it home, this is as if we were able to pull out the genes in a mule that came from the donkey versus the horse, so to speak. So across all of the hybrids, we noted that both parents are pretty much represented equally in each one of the hybrid genomes. We have you know, roughly half blue genes, roughly half red genes, corresponding to the genes from Spinulosporus and the quadrilineatus like species. And highlighting the same strain that I highlighted during the molecular phylogenetic analysis, this is strain ASFU2033, and you can clearly see that bimodal distribution, as well as near equal representation of genes from each parent. So being able to assign which parts of the genome came from each parent allowed us to do various analyses. For example, we looked at the stability of gene pairs. We looked for signatures of recombination, copy number variants, and euploides. And across all of this analysis, um, we, we believe that the hybrids are genetically stable. And this could be for a couple of reasons. One, they're truly genetically stable and this is not um, an unstable genomic state for this particular organism. Or these hybrids are very young and we haven't yet, there hasn't been enough time for their genomes to decay, which is often the case for hybrids. So again, with this, we were able to also do some more analyses such as ask the question of how different is Aspergillus spinulosporus from this Aspergillus quadrilineatus like species. And unlike the, the mule where the horse and the donkey are roughly 1% diverged from one another, we noted that these two parents are about as distinct as a human is to a lemur or 8% diverged. So a substantial amount of divergence, but roughly on par with some of the other fungal pathogens that have been observed previously. Next, I'll move into the, uh, the phenotyping of the hybrids. By and large, what we noted when it came to the, the hybrids of the phenotypes is that there was wide phenotypic variation. So a lot of the phenotyping that we did focused on examining traits related to virulence or virulence itself. So we looked at um, interactions with human immune cells. We looked at drug susceptibility, growth in various conditions like 37 degrees, the temperature of a human, to try and get a sense of, of where the, what were these hybrids like? Were they similar or different to each one of their parents and so on and so forth. So all of the phenotyping can be summarized using principal component analysis. And what we noted is that the, the hybrids, again, exhibited wide phenotypic variation, which you can tell by how diffuse they are, especially along that first dimension. Another thing that we can see is that they're more like one parent over the other. They're more like Aspergillus spinulosporus than they are like Aspergillus quadrilineatus in red. Now, this may be because Aspergillus quadrilineatus is not the exact parent, but it's as close as we could get um, for, for the current project or, or at this time. Another thing to note is that they're very distinct from Aspergillus nigillans, which is shown in the bottom left of the PCA plot in dark gray. And again, those the Aspergillus nigillans is what um, these isolates were originally identified as in the clinic. Just to give you an example of wide phenotypic variation, just for one uh, particular phenotype, is that we measured the Kaplan-Meier curves or these kill curves 
in a Galeria invertebrate moth model. And what we were able to observe is that sometimes Aspergillus latus is the most virulent, such as strain ASFU 1710, so it killed Galeria the fastest, but sometimes Aspergillus strains were the least virulent, such as Aspergillus latus MO 46149, which is shown towards the top and has, you know, the goes down the least highest percent survival at the end of the 10 day experiment. So even though we did exhibit, uh, find wide phenotypic variation, at other times we found that the traits of the different species were more similar to one parent over the other. So for example, Aspergillus, um, the Aspergillus latus hybrids were more like Aspergillus spinulosporus when it came to drug susceptibility, or they were more like Aspergillus quadrilineatus when it came to resistance to hyphal killing by human immune cells. And in both cases, it was the more robust phenotype. So they were less susceptible to drugs in comparison to um, Aspergillus quadrilineatus, and they were more resistant to hyphal killing in comparison to Aspergillus spinulosporus. And this is very reminiscent of what happens when in the mule, where from the donkey, from the horse, it gets some of the best traits from both of its parents. And so we hypothesize whether or not this is hybrid vigor, and this is something that we're going to investigate further, whether or not these strains have a robust signature of hybrid vigor. So with that, um, I'd like to go over just the main findings of the project, which are summarized in the graphical abstract, where we sequence these clinical isolates of Aspergillus fungi. Um, and we found evidence of allodiploid hybridization, as well as a surprising amount of genome stability amongst the clinical isolates. And then when it came to their phenotypes, they differed widely, and at times they differed from both of their parents in various clinically relevant phenotypes, including virulence. Now, I think more broadly, this uh, project can be summarized by two points, one of which is medical. And I think it's that we show the importance of accurate isolate identification in the clinic as well as strain heterogeneity. So it's essentially a message of know thy enemy. If we're going to des design disease management strategies, um, it's gonna be best if we know the species um, that we're dealing with and possibly even more nuanced differences therein with strain heterogeneity being accounted for. Evolutionarily, we propose that hybridization is this general mode of fungal pathogen evolution. At the beginning of the talk, I had mentioned hybrid filamentous fungal pathogens of plants. And then um, I had also mentioned filamentous fungal, uh, not filamentous, yeast pathogens of animals, um, but not really filamentous fungal pathogens of animals. And so we think, it, to my knowledge, this is uh, approximately the first or, or one of the earlier studies to ever report this. So with that, I would like to thank Abigail Lind again who's now at the Gladstone Institute at, over at, in the Bay Area, as well as my advisor, Antonis Rokas, and a key collaborator, Gustavo Goldman, who helped immensely with this project. Additionally, I would like to thank the James H. Gilliam Fellowship uh, via the Howard Hughes Medical Institute for their funding of my pre-doctoral work. And again, thank you to the organizers. Thanks for having me. Definitely appreciate being here. All right, that was an awesome talk. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, so uh, people, if they have questions, please uh, post them in the live chat box and uh, I will then take them to Jacob. But uh, meanwhile, I have a couple of questions for you. Um, one is um, in these deployed hybrids, um, do you see any cases of recombination between chromosomes of two species? Yeah, um, we did not really find evidence of recombination, uh, which we were kind of surprised to see. So it's really like there's two coexisting genomes in one nucleus. Hmm. But okay. these genomes were generated via Illumina technology. And so one of the things that we're looking to do in the future is some long read genome sequencing to get better resolution of genome structure in these hybrids. Okay. And um, 
one more question that I have is in the cases where you said that there is um, so in some properties like drug resistance so the hybrids match to one parent less with the others is that because of the gene content of say for example genes responsible for drug resistance are coming from one parent but not from the other or is there a difference at that level among the two parents yeah, yeah. because the genomes are really like the totality of both parents together because it came mm -hmm. from cellular fusion followed by nuclear fusion. We think that the, the best way to address this question is via transcriptomics, where we can look at transcript abundance from each of the genes that came from each of the parents. And so it's, it, it's unlikely, but it's possible that one parent is transcriptionally silent. And so we, th we think that those types of, of analyses are gonna help shed light on that Okay. Okay. So, any questions from anybody else? Okay. I guess no. Uh, I don't see any questions. So, uh, if anybody has questions watching it later on, I think you can paste it in the comment section and Jacob or I will be visiting to see it uh, at a later time point. And meanwhile, thank you everyone for joining and thank you Jacob for a wonderful talk. Yeah, thank you very much. And please feel free to email me with any questions if you have them. Okay, uh, hold on, we have one question. So Pedro Lopez says, good talk Jacob. What are the ecological niches for these strains besides the Galeria model? Uh, have you tried to compare virulence of hybrids in mouse models? Yeah, we haven't compared virulence in mice yet. That's definitely something we want to do, but I'm not sure if it, it will be done, to be perfectly honest. Okay. When it comes to the ecology of the hybrids, fungal ecology is a bit tricky. Um, because there's spores everywhere. And so we're not exactly sure what the ecology of this organism is, which is the case of many different fungi, but that's definitely something that would be exciting to look into. It's hard to know because single locus sequencing or Malditoff or some of these other things will misidentify the species, right? It was at first identified as Aspergillus nigillans. Um, and not Aspergillus latus. So there's not a lot of literature that we can lean on to, to know more about the species. All right. Thank you uh, again, Jacob, and thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Have a nice day. You too. Bye.